Pompeii was a major Roman city in Campania on the Italian peninsula, buried in volcanic ash following the Mount Vesuvius eruption in the year 79. The city was archaeologically excavated in the 19th and 20th centuries, and its superbly preserved state provides an invaluable glimpse into Roman daily life. Pompeii is perhaps the world's most valuable archaeological site when it comes to the amount of evidence available to scholars. The first societies established themselves there during the Bronze Age. Around the 4th century BC, the city came under Roman rule. In the wake of seismic activity and changing coastlines, the ancient city moved two kilometers inland. But it would have been much closer to the sea and the Sarno estuary in Roman times, and approximately four meters below. The Roman city of Pompeii spans about three square kilometers. A third has yet to be excavated, but the outer suburbs were also heavily populated. Hundreds of farms and around a hundred villas also dotted the surrounding landscape. The city's population before the eruption was said to be between 10 and 12,000 people, a third of whom were slaves. The Campania coast was a favorite playground of Rome's wealthy, and many of the villas were especially grand, with panoramic sea views. Emperor Nero is thought to have owned a villa near Pompeii, and it is worth remembering that his wife, Pompeii Sabina, was a local. Pompeii was a major port on the Bay of Naples, and neighboring settlements would send their products to Pompeii for transportation across the empire. According to Roman custom, the city was encircled by a wall with numerous gates, generally with two or three arched doorways to keep pedestrian and vehicular traffic separate. There were wide paved streets within the walls in a rather regular layout, but no street names or numbers. Evidence also shows that traffic was limited to one direction on certain streets. The city features a surprising jumble of several thousand buildings. Stores, large villas, simple houses, temples, taverns, a pottery store, an exercise ground, baths, an arena, public toilets, a municipal market, schools, a basilica, theaters, and brothels. Many brothels. All in all, Pompeii boasted all the facilities one would expect to find in a wealthy and thriving community. Sports were one of the favorite activities during leisure time. The town had two gymnasiums where people practiced discus throwing, long jump, and wrestling. Men and women took turns in the baths after working out. The full session included heated water, a steam room, and cold showers. Once clean and relaxed, they moved on to waxing sessions, a common practice among young men, and massages. Pompeii had a vibrant cultural life. The poor attended the open-air theater, where satires, comedies, and tragedies were extremely popular. On the other hand, the aristocracy chose the indoor Odeon, which housed music concerts and poetry recitals. But nothing attracted as many people as the gladiatorial contests, which crowded the amphitheater, capable of holding the city's entire population. It was a dangerous sport. In 59 BC, during one of the games, a fierce brawl between local hooligans and visitors from nearby New Syria led the Senate to outlaw the games in Pompeii for a decade. During the first century, economic prosperity, religious freedom, and a plethora of leisure and entertainment options made Pompeii one of the most enjoyable places to live in the entire Roman Empire. Its fertile land and mild climate were perfect for growing grapes, which drove wine production. The wool industry was also booming. But living near a volcano could be a permanent source of danger, and people knew it. The area around Mount Vesuvius was given its first warning sign that the mountain might be reawakening when a major earthquake occurred on February 5th in the year 62. The earthquake hit at 7.5 on the Richter scale and laid waste to the surrounding towns. Even parts of Naples were battered and the city is 32 kilometers away from Mount Vesuvius. Few Pompeii buildings survived the damage. Temples, houses, and parts of the city's dense walls collapsed. Fires devastated parts of the city, and even sheep died due to poisonous gases being released. The death toll was likely in the thousands, rather than hundreds. The city's water supply was also badly disrupted with damage to aqueducts and underground pipes, 
The recovery process was also hampered by the collapse of the bridge over the River Sarno. The situation was so bleak that a significant portion of the population left the town for good. But little by little, the village made some hasty and some more measured repairs and life began to resume. The civic repairs and improvements were probably also stimulated by the visit of Emperor Nero in 64, an event that led to the ban on gladiatorial games being lifted after the famous tumults in 59. Only, you see, Vesuvius was a behemoth that would soon wake up, and it did. Seismic activity did continue over the next decade, but it seems not to have unduly disturbed the population. Life and repairs from the 62 catastrophe continued until 79. Then, at the peak of summer, odd things started to happen. Fish floated dead in the Sarno. Fountains and wells dried up unexplainably, and vines on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius eerily withered and perished. Seismic activity, albeit not strong, increased dramatically. There was something amiss. Bizarrely, although some people left the city, most people still seemed unconcerned about the events that were unfolding. But little did they know that they were about to experience an apocalypse. On the morning of August 24, 79, a terrific rumble indicated that the magma that had been building up over the last thousand years had at last erupted from the Vesuvius crater. Flames and smoke billowed out of the volcano. It may have seemed at this point that the mountain was offering nothing more than a harmless pyrotechnic display. But at noon, Mount Vesuvius erupted. An even bigger explosion blew off the entire cone of Vesuvius, and a huge, mushroom-shaped mass of stone particles rose 43 kilometers into the sky. The blast was calculated to be 100,000 times greater than the nuclear bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. The ash that started to fall on Pompeii was light, but the density was such that it covered everything in centimeters within minutes. People attempted to flee the city or sought shelter wherever they could, and those left without shelter desperately tried to stay above the shifting layers of volcanic debris. Finally, in late afternoon, there was another loud explosion ringing through the air, sending a pillar of ash 10 kilometers higher than the preceding cloud. When the ash fell, it was much heavier than the first eruption, and the volcanic material that smothered the city was already meters thick. Buildings started to collapse under the accumulated weight. Survivors clumped together near walls and under stairs for protection some embracing their loved ones or holding on to their most precious belongings. Then, at 11 p.m., the enormous cloud looming over the volcano collapsed under its own weight and burst over the city in six shattering waves of superheated ash and air that asphyxiated and literally seared the bodies of the entire population. Yet the ash kept falling, and the once vibrant city was mercilessly buried meters underground, only to be lost and forgotten, swept from the face of the earth. Volcanic eruptions occur in stages. It is not just a sudden downpour of lava onto the land surrounding the volcano. Although experts have argued about which stage of the eruption people would most likely succumb to, one certainty is that none of them would have survived the fourth pyroclastic wave, a wall of ash and gas that quickly hit the city in the early morning of August 25th. When these burning toxins reach someone, they immediately trigger muscle contractions and what one expert called thermal shock, and this accounts for the crouching and bending positions in which historians have found so many of the victims. The heat and gas instantaneously killed everyone they hit, even those who stayed in the city. Since they were gone in less than a second, there was no time for them to feel anything. Pompeii was far from the only city to face devastation when Vesuvius erupted. The city of Herculaneum, which was situated closer to the volcano, was also ravaged. As it became clear that the volcano would kill everyone, some residents fled to the beach, hoping to board ships and escape safely across the Bay of Naples. Naples was also struck by the volcano's gases. While experts concur that most of Pompeii's residents died instantly from the pyroclastic flow, 
there is some evidence that a few victims died of asphyxiation. The toxic blend of gas and fine ash in the air was likely harmful enough to kill a person. Archaeologists dug up the skeleton of a man they believe died of asphyxiation in 2018. In total, around 2,000 Pompeians died in the disaster. Pompeii was not rediscovered until 1755, when work began on the construction of the Sarno Canal. The local stories of the city turned out to have been based on fact, when under just a few meters of volcanic debris, there was an entire city. Following a series of major excavations, Pompeii has since become an essential stop-off point for tourists, archaeologists, and researchers.